Hi, my name is Kenji Asanaga. This talk is about a new framework of bridge security. This is a joint work with Shun Watanabe. In this talk, we want to consider what is bridge security. It is, in some sense, a well-established measure of quantifying the security level of cryptographic primitives. We say primitive P has K bit security if every adversary needs two to three K operations to break P. So the question is, how can we define bit security? As an example, let's consider the case of one year function. Let F be a function. We say an adversary breaks, adversary A breaks one variance of F. If given a sample F of X, A ups, up to, outputs the string Y, satisfying F of X is equal to F of Y. We, come to, we want to consider the computational cost needed to break one variance. We have two simple solutions. The first one is the brute force search. For every string y, the algorithm checks if f of x is equal to f of y until it finds a solution. The second one is random guessing. For random string y, the algorithm checks if f of x is equal to f of y. The algorithm iterates the procedure until it finds a solution. In either case, the algorithm needs order of two to n iterations to find a solution. So the total computational cost is order tf times two to n, where tf is the cost for evaluating the function f. And we may have another solution, namely. There is some good algorithm A with computational complexity T such that A breaks the one way with probability epsilon. In this case, let's consider what if we invoke the algorithm in total n times. The probability that some algorithm breaks one way will be amplified to epsilon n. Since it is sufficient to choose n is equal to one over epsilon. So the total computational cost of order n times t is equal to order t over epsilon. We have seen three solutions to estimate the cost of breaking one witness. We notice that the cost of order t over epsilon is consistent in all solutions. In the root of search, the cost is tf times to the n, and epsilon is equal to one. When we use random guessing, cost is just tf, and the epsilon is equal to two to the minus n. So, based on this observation, the bit security should be defined as the minimum value of the log base two of t over epsilon. And this way of defining bit security can be extended to other search type primitives, such as signature schemes and the message of this course, and also the search type assumptions, such as factoring, DL problem, and CDH assumption. So the question we want to ask in this work is how to define bit security of decision type primitive debits and assumptions, such as pseudo-random generators, action schemes, and DDT assumption. In decision game, the adversary's winning probability is designed to be close to one half. So we usually define the advantage of the adversary as two times the absolute value of the winning probability minus one half. 
So we want to know this advantage is the light measure for evaluating beach security. In this work, we introduced a new framework for defining beach security. It is defined for security games. And we apply the same operational meaning for search and decision games. The interpretation is that game G has KBG security if every attacker needs computational cost of to this K for winning the game with high probability. Since we consider that two types of search and decision games should be structurally different, we define the winning condition for the two types differently. And as an answer to the second question in the previous slide, we show that in our framework, the learning the advantage is the right measure for evaluating bit security of decision games. And we show several natural reduction of bit security between security games. And finally, we compare our framework with the one proposed by Michel and Walter in 2018. Now we describe our, our framework. There are two adversaries, an uh, inner adversary and an outer adversary. The inner adversary plays a user security game G, which is an interaction between an adversary and a challenger. Uh, we assume that for every game, a challenger chooses a random secret U of length N. For such games, we usually require that the adversary's winning probability should be close to zero. For decision games, the secret is just a bit, and the winning condition is to predict the big U. In this case, the winning probability is designed to be close to one half. And the task of the outer adversary is to invoke local game G many times to amplify the winning probability. Next, we will define the winning condition for the outer adversary. First, consider the case of the search game. The outer adversary collects information from the inner adversaries. Here, we assume that each inner adversary plays an independent game with fresh randomness UI. The winning condition of the outer, outer adversary is that there is some inner adversary who wins the local game. So the task of the outer adversary is to invoke inner adversaries sufficiently many times so that some inner adversary wins the local game. Next, consider the case of the decision game. We assume that each inner adversary plays an independent game with consistent secret, secret bit U. Namely, a secret bit, bit U is initially sampled, and the same secret is used in each local game. After collecting information from the inner adversaries, the outer adversary finally outputs his prediction U prime. The winning condition is that the prediction is equal to U. So the task of the outer adversary is to invoke inner adversaries many times until he can collect sufficient information to predict U. In our framework, the bit security is defined as the minimal value of the log base two of n times t, where n is the number of invocations by the other adversary, and t is the computational cost of conducting the local game. The minimum is taken over all inner and outer adversaries with the restriction that 
the adult mastery within the game is probably at least one minus mu, where mu is some small constant called the error probability. This formulation means that the best security is the log of the total computational cost needed to achieve the winning probability at least one minus mu. We have several implications. First, for such games, the bit security must take a finite value. The reason is that if the output length of the inner adversary is M, a random guessing adversary can win the game with probability at least two to the minus M. So the total cost of, of two to the M is sufficient to win the game with high probability. So the bit security is at most M. In contrast, a decision game may have infinite bit security. We can understand it by considering the one-time path encryption or perfectly secure encryption schemes. Since no adversary can increase the advantage in the this indistinguishability game, we cannot amplify the winning probability to one minus mu. So the bit security is infinite. Finally, we observe that in the decision game, the outer adversary collects samples from inner adversaries to distinguish the two cases. This is the task called binary hypothesis testing in information theory or statistics. So we can use the existing knowledge from the literature to characterize this task. We characterize our bit security in the following theorem. For any security game G, the bit security is equal to the minimum value of the log plus two of T over the advantage of the inner adversary. Namely, we can exclude the outer adversary and the bit security can be evaluated by the, by the inner adversary. Where the advantage is defined as follows, for such games, it is equal to the winning probability of the adversary, uh, which is, we can easily understand. For decision games, the advantage is called the Rennie advantage, which is equal to the Rennie divergence of order one half between two distributions, A0 and A1, where AU is the absolute distribution of the inner adversary under the condition that you was chosen as a secret. We investigate the behavior of the Rennie advantage by comparing it with the conventional advantage. Suppose that the win probability of the, the inner adversary is equal to one plus epsilon over two, then the conventional advantage is equal to epsilon. The Lenny advantage is given us in the previous slide. And we show that for any decision gain, the Lenny advantage is bounded to below by epsilon squared and is bounded above by epsilon. Also, we show that the Lenny, the Lenny advantage is equal to the lower bound for balanced adversaries where we say an adversary is balanced if it outputs any value with at least constant probability. Using this proposition, we can resolve a peculiar problem of linear tests for pseudonym generators. Let's look at this problem. Consider a pseudonym generator G with C length N, it is known that for any pseudorandom generators, there exists a linear test T that achieves the conventional advantage of two to the minus N over two. Since non-trivial non linear tests are to zero and one with equal probability, they are balanced. Thus, the learning advantage will be two to the minus N from the previous proposition. 
So if the bit security is equal to log base two of T over the conventional advantage, the bit security must be at most n over two. However, it is counterintuitive because it still seems unnatural that any bit stage pseudo under the generator must have bit security at most n over two. In our framework, since the bit security is characterized by the, by the Rennie advantage, it is possible to achieve any bit security. And we note that the Michant and the Walter also resolved this problem by their framework in a different way. And in our framework, we show several natural bit security reductions. Uh, K-bit secure pseudorandom generator implies a K-bit secure one function. Uh, K-bit secure in the CPA encryption schemes implies the K-bit secure one CPA encryption scheme. Also, the K-bit secure DDH assumption implies K-bit secure CDH assumption. And regarding the gold right web theorem, we show that K-bit secure one function implies a K-bit secure hardcore predicate for balanced adversaries. However, proving the general case remains old. For the distribution approximation problem, we show a natural composition of bit security. Suppose that game G employing distribution Q has K bit security, and suppose that two distributions P and Q are K bit secure in this, in this interval. Then we show that game G employing distribution P instead of Q is K bit secure. And this relation holds both in search and tissue games. We believe, briefly see the bit security framework proposed by Michel and Walter. They define the bit security as the log best two of T over some advantage introduced in their paper. It is defined using the mutual information and the channel entropy of random variables X and Y, where X is the random secret of the game as in our framework, and Y is defined as false. It is equal to the Fehler symbol board if the adversary adds both, and it is equal to X if the adversary wins the game. And in other cases, Y is chosen uniformly at random under the condition that it is not equal to X. This advantage captures some correlations between X and Y. However, it is difficult to understand what it means in this form. After introducing the advantage, they showed that that advantage can be approximated as false. For such games, as in our framework, it is the winning probability of the adversary. For decision games, it is equal to alpha a times the square of two beta a minus one, where alpha a is a probability that a has the value other than bot, and that a is a conditional probability that a wins a game g under the condition that a has the value other than bot. By this characterization, we can see that if the conventional advantage is in this game is at the most two to the minus k over two for every adversary, then the game has k bit security. Also in their framework, the classical Gorilla-Hilabian theorem gives a tight reduction. Namely, k bit secure one function implies k bit secure hardcore predicate. Compared to their results, the difference from our framework are as follows. First, our notion has an operational meaning. Second, if the conventional advantage at most two to the minus k over two, then 
it does not imply that it has kept the security. In our framework, the bit security lies between k over two and k. Also proving the tightness of the gorilla helium theorem. To prove it, we need to input reduction algorithms. We conclude our talk. We introduce a security framework with operational meaning. The interpretation is that game G has kept security if every attacker needs a computational cost of two to the K or within the game with a high probability. We show that in our framework, the Lenny advantage is a large measure for evaluating bit security. A possible future work is to give a tight reduction of the gold helium theorem. And since we have several frameworks to evaluate bit security, people may wonder which notion should, should be employed. So it may be beneficial to discuss the measure for selecting the bit security notion. For example, building some actions for bit security may be possible. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>